Janine uh, Van Order from University of Bielefeld. Uh, the title is as you can see over. Okay, first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's a huge pleasure and honor to be speaking here and to be invited and also to be back in Canada after over a decade. So the title of my talk is Bounds for Mordal Bay Ranks um, by Estimates of Fourier Coefficients and Anamorphic Periods. I'll we'll talk a lot about the first, I'll spend half the lecture talking about the first part of that and then go very quickly through the, the last two parts after the word via. So the first thing I wanna talk about is elliptic curves. So elliptic curves, Let's let E be an elliptic curve over a number field K. Um, what this means is that E is a smooth plane cubic curve defined over the number. You could take K to be the rational numbers if you like. Um, and it has a pointed infinity or a non-trivial yeah, base point. It's a smooth cubic curve in P2. You can view it as um, solutions to a polynomial P E um, in, in two variables, uh, X and Y. Uh, so polynomial with um, algebraic integer coefficients, um, the degree three polynomial, and it takes the form y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b for some k rational numbers, which are k rational integers, um, a and b, and the discriminants uh, given by the usual formula is not zero. So we study the set of, again, you, you're free to take k to be the rational number field here. I'm just being a little bit more general uh, for later. You consider the set of k rational solutions or points and in fact, by um, the chord tangent construction, which can be drawn, you can find a way of start starting with two points and, and creating a third point. And this uh, chord tangent construction gives the set of K rational points the structure of an abelian group. And a theorem um, first proven by Louis Mordell in the 1920s uh, for the rational number field K, but then later generalized by Andre Bay um, to any global field is that EK has the structure of a finitely generated abelian group. So it's isomorphic to a finite number of copies of the integers, REK, the algebraic rank, plus a finite torsion subgroup, which I denote by EK torus. And yeah, I mean, a hundred years later, this represents most of what we know about the arithmetic of elliptic curves, unfortunately. <laughs> Are you, okay, I, I will say a bit more. Um, so motivating questions here, million dollar question, if you can answer this in any case, the Clay Mathematics Institute is offering a million dollars. What is the rank of a given elliptic curve over a number field, even over Q? This remains open. And a related question if you fix an elliptic curve in a number field and you let L vary over finite extensions in some abelian tower number fields, how does the rank behave? And this is the question I would like to address in this lecture. Um, classical motivation before I do that because I realize the audience is large, who cares? Well, consider the oldest open problem in all of mathematics. It's the congruent number problem. I'm getting there. I'm, no, 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 I, I, will, I will get to, I, I, will, I, will give you a status, I will give you a status update of what is known, okay? We know something, if rank zero, rank zero or one, and K is the rational number field or an imaginary quadratic field, and in that case, E has a complex the has complex multiplication by the wing of integers of k, and the rank is less than or equal to one, then yes, we know the conjecture. And I'm going to explain the recipe. But we don't even have a single example for rank two. Single example. But I'll get there. Let me just first give the motivation for why uh, people are interested in this problem, because you've probably all heard about Birch and Sinner and Dyer. And I'd like to advertise why it's a fundamental problem. So the oldest open problem in mathematics. Um, referenced in written work by Arab scholars dating back to the 10th century. But we have evidence that uh, Babylonian scribes were writing down these numbers um, maybe 2000 years ago. Is, you know, simply ask for parameterization of all congruent numbers, similar to parameterization of Pythagorean triples. What is a congruent number? Well, you say that an integer n greater than or equal to one is congruent. If you can find a right triangle, um, with a rational, rational sides and hypotenuse whose area is equal to n. And um, in case you think this is easy, <laughs> go home and try it. So example, n equals six is the easiest example. Okay, n equals five, you can also figure out with a little bit of work, but you can see the edges of uh, sort of the smallest triangle aren't so easy to see. They're not easy for me to see by inspection. Okay, and n equals seven, 
also for me not easy to see by inspection. But actually, n equals one is not congruent, and it, Greek mathematicians were not able to show this. Uh, there was a lot of fighting, I believe, and it wasn't until um, hundreds of years later that Pierre de Fermat devised a method that he called the method of infinite descent to show that n equals one and actually n a square can never be a congruent number. It's basically an elaborate counterexample. If you assume that, that one is a congruent number, is a square is a congruent number, you can sort of create a series of, uh, yeah, I mean, you can, you can drive a contradiction in a series of steps. And this method, the so-called method of infinite descent is really the birth of the modern theory of elliptic curves. And I'd like to explain, well, this is one more example, just, just in case you think this is easy. Here's an example from Don Zagier. Um, I don't think he did it by hand. I think he did it with a computer. But n equals 157 is a congruent number. <laughs> and this is the smallest triangle he could find. Like these, are, these are the edges of the... Yeah, so it's not, it's not easy to just sit down with a pen and pencil and or, you know, pen and paper and figure out what all the congruent numbers are. So in general, we expect all integers n congruent to 5, 6, or 7 modulo 8 to be congruent. And we expect all integers, um, positive integers, of course, uh, congruent to 1, 2, or 3 modulo 8 to be non-congruent. But even this weaker conjecture remains open. In spite of a recent breakthrough by Ye Tian, which deals exclusively with the n congruent to 6 mod 8 case, the conjecture is still, in general, open. Um, but it's actually a question, it's actually a, a problem about elliptic curves. So if you make substitutions in, in what I've written here, you take x equals n times a plus b over b and y equals 2 times n squared uh, times a plus c over b squared, it's easy to check that n is congruent if and only if the elliptic curve with this equation. So um, e superscript n given by y squared equals x cubed minus nx has a point of infinite order or infinitely many rational solutions, i.e. if the rank is greater than or equal to 1. And so if you could if you could find um, a procedure to determine when a uh, given elliptic curve over a number field, even over, even over Q, um, this very special family uh, has a point of infinite order, you would prove this oldest open problem in mathematics. I'd like to emphasize it's still open. <laughs> even this congruent number problem is still open. The, the weaker conjecture that I wrote down is still open. Yeah, so equipped with access to an early computer in the 1960s, because apparently Swinnard and Dyer couldn't get a lectureship in mathematics. He could only get a lectureship in the computer science department. Or, so he got a job at the computer laboratory. Um, Peter Swinnard and Dyer and Brian Birch tried to prove the congruent number problem brute force. They wanted to, they wanted to calculate all the solutions mod P of, um, of, these elliptic, of, of this family of elliptic curves, which I just wrote down, and sort of to prove the congruent number problem. But, their calculations led, to, led them to the following remarkable conjecture. When they tried to do this, they ended up cooking up a generating function and uh, making a conjecture about it, which is now very well known. So if, if you assume e over q is more generally um, given by a polynomial in this so-called Weierstrass form, y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b for integer, rational integers a and b, um, you write a delta to denote the discriminant of the polynomial. If you give it a prime p, let's write hash EFP to denote the number of points, the number of solutions mod P. Okay. And then we consider um, this coefficient A, P, which is given by the difference of the prime P and the number of solutions mod P. And uh, I, I, should, I should mark we have this classical boundary, the Hasse, which tells you that these, these coefficients can be no greater than P times, excuse me, two times the square root of P. Now, what Burgesson and Dyer did is they, they looked at the curve defined over Q. And they introduced a complex variable. They want, to, they want to consider an Euler product over all the, the good places of some factors. So they consider this generating series, uh, which is given by an Euler product over all odd, odd primes not dividing the discriminants of the polynomial of these factors, um, 1 minus AP uh, times P to the minus S plus P to the 1 minus 2S inverse, which by comparison with the Riemann zeta function, you, you can just deduce uh, is absolutely convergent for real part of S greater than 3 over 2. The first part of their conjecture is that this, um, this generating series with the complex variable introduced has an analytic continuation to an entire function and moreover satisfies the functional equation relating values at s to minus s. That's a little bit bold, but um, they, they made this conjecture based on empirical evidence. They didn't, uh, it didn't come out of thin air. But then after, after, after making this conjecture, they conjecture that uh, the order of vanishing of this generating series 
um, at the central point for the functional equation is equal to the algebraic rank. So um, I should say that we now know the first part of this conjecture due to modularity, uh, by which I mean the fundamental theorem of Wiles, Taylor Wiles and Breuer, Conrad, Dunn and Taylor, which actually gives something more general. So E is modular in the sense that there exists a non-constant subjective rational morphism between the modular curve of level N equal to the conductor of the elliptic curve to E. Don't need to know what that means. What it means here uh, for the purposes of my talk is that actually the, the so-called Hasse-Weyall function, which I introduced before, has an analytic continuation to an automorphic L function. It's essentially a shift of a Mellon transform of some modular form, um, holomorphic modular form, of weight two and level equal to the conductor on the upper half plane. These Fourier coefficients are the same coefficients that I defined before. This is a remarkable connection, which is not at all obvious a priori. And in fact, um, it was first conjectured by some Japanese mathematicians in the 1960s. And many people thought the conjecture was crazy until it was. OK, so yeah, this is the first part of the conjecture. Are there any questions? You're nodding. <laughs> OK. No, 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 no
can be reduced or related to a question about non-vanishing of central values of automorphic golf functions. And then if time permits, I explain a technique that brings some, um, you can reinterpret the averages uh, that you need to study to establish non-vanishing results to estimates for Fourier coefficients of automorphic forms and also to automorphic periods. And this is a very interesting and hot topic uh, for research in general, but this is sort of how it fits in uh, to arithmetic geometry. So how do we prove these results? I mentioned before, use modularity, integral presentations, and the so-called Iwasawa main conjectures. So in a nutshell, yeah, how does this work? Let me first say very vaguely how it works and then give some more precise information in a specific situation um, where K is an imaginary quantitative field. By modularity, you never work with the half of AL function. You never, you just work with the Mellon transform of the, um, the cuspidal eigenform. You know a lot more about the analytic properties. And surprisingly, you introduce a prime P. This is really not intuitive at all. But you introduce a prime P and you study some piatic avatar of a family of central values. I'll say more precisely what that means in a minute. And um, what I mean by a family here is, let's say you have a K is an imaginary quadratic field and you look at all the Hacker characters, you look at all the Edel class characters of K and you consider um, families of the twisted Hasse Bayal functions, which have analytic continuations to, to rankin selberg type L functions. And you consider all of those, all of those values together for some, you know, for, for all of the Edel class, Hacker characters or Edel class characters of K, which are maybe unramified outside of a given prime P, but out of, outside of the given prime P. And you study some, you construct some measure which, which contains information about all those values. And, um, and, and then you, you find a very clever way to construct cohomology classes, Galois cohomology classes um, to form an Euler system. It's like some sort of compatible system of classes which are related to the LP. And then you can use this Iwasawa main conjecture argument or this Euler system argument to bound the Selmer group. I'm not going to explain fully how that works. So I'm really just giving you an overview. Um, but if you use this machine, um, this so-called Iwasawa main conjecture machine, you reduce questions about bounding Mordell Vey ranks of elliptic curves in certain abelian extensions, at least, to problems about non-vanishing of central values and central derivative values of automorphic L functions. So prototype setup, uh, which is one I've, I've worked on a lot myself and published in this area, is you take an elliptic curve defined over Q, and you take an imaginary quadratic field of discriminant D. I didn't write that, but um, henceforth, K is an imaginary quadratic field of discriminant D. P is a prime of good ordinary reduction for E. That basically means you, you have the polynomial and you reduce small P and you still have an elliptic curve. Okay, so it's, it's, the nicest, it's the nicest situation you can consider. Um, we, in this situation, we have an explicit description of the class field theory. We can really generate all the abelian extensions of K on ramified set of P in terms of special values, in terms of roots of unity and special values of automorphic functions. I just say very briefly how that works. I will draw a picture in a minute. It's like uh, on the one side, you can, you can consider, you can just, you, you want to describe the maximal abelian unramified outside of P extension of K. On the one hand, you can adjoin all primitive piece power roots of unity. You'll get a cyclotomic extension. Um, there's a cyclotomic ZP extension inside uh, Galois group, which profinite Galois group, which I denote by gamma. And on the other side, you have um, the ring class, the, the union of all ring class extensions of P power conductor. Uh, in very con and this will have a, an anti so called anti cyclotomic ZP extension. Um, right, omega to node Scalable group. And if you want to be explicit about how these abelian extensions are generated, we know what you can do for each, uh, for each exponent alpha greater than or equal to zero is consider the Z order of conductor P to the alpha in K. And you embed K into the complex numbers and you view that as a lattice. And you evaluate the modular J function of this order and you get an algebraic number. And these numbers generate these abelian extensions. So we really have, if I write k, k infinity to note the compositum of all ZP extensions of K with G its Galois group, I, I can really draw a picture of what the maximal abelian unramified at P extension looks like. Um, so you, you can really, if you want to study the growth of Mordell Bay ranks in this tower, it's very convenient because you can really describe all the layers in a very precise way. So we want to study, um, we want to study the Mordell Vey group indirectly through the, pre -prim the P primary Selmer group, which I will introduce in a minute. We also want to look at the, um, we also want to look at uh, Iwasawa algebras corresponding to this profile of the Billion group G, uh, specifically G, the Galois group of the ZP squared extension, isomorphic to ZP squared, ZP squared, excuse me. So this is just going to be the completed group algebra 
of, of G. So it'll be an inverse limit over um, all open normal subgroups of G of the group rings with coefficients in ZP. Uh, the elements correspond to measures. It's, it's really a lemma with definitions to see that any element in this completed group algebra uh, can be identified with a ZP valued measure on G, which I denote by D, uh, D whatever the element is. And so that means there's a natural notion of integration. Like if you have a finite order character G, uh, W of G, there's gonna be a natural way to, to consider what, what it means to integrate over the group. And so this is what I meant by the piatic avatar LP that I introduced before. Uh, first, I need to say something about the values. So there's a remarkable theorem of Goro Shimura um, known in the automorphic literature as a rationality theorem. If you're given a finite order character of G, um, you know that the, well, this is not Shimura's theorem, but you deduce from modularity plus the theory of rank and Selberg convolution that the Hasse al function of E over K twisted by one of these characters is given by the rank and Selberg al function of the eigenform F parameterizing E times the theta, the Hecke, the theta series constructed by Hecke associated to um, the character W. No, it's not an absolute Galois group. It's the Galois group of the ZP squared extension. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. It's in the diagram, which I went through very quickly. It's the ZP squared extension. So it's isomorphic to ZP squared. And um, in the diagram, the, the Galois group, cyclotomic ZP extension is lambda, and it's omega for the anti cyclotomic ZP extension. And so, remarkable theorem of Shimura, simple proof, um, is very deep insight. So, you take these central values, these Rank and Selberg all functions, you divide out by a period, specifically 8 pi squared times the Peterson norm of f, you get an algebraic number. Um, f, it, it's, it's crucial here that f is an eigenform, a holomorphic eigenform. It, it doesn't work for mass forms, this argument. Um, so, you get a family of algebraic numbers. We're going to embed, we're going to fix an embedding of q bar, um, the algebraic numbers into qp bar, and we get a, a family of piatic algebraic numbers. So, the piatic avatar I mentioned is really just an element of the Iwasawa algebra which when viewed as a measure, interpolates piatically those, those algebraic numbers. So here you, you know there exists a measure. Yeah, okay, there's a typo here. Oh, yeah, yeah, there exists a measure um, corresponding to an element LP in the Iwasawa algebra, which interpolates these algebraically normalized values. I, for any finite order character W of the profinite group G, which is isomorphic to ZP squared, um, you can you can specialize or integrate against the character, and you get um, up to so the squiggly the squiggly quality means equality up to some precise harmless non vanishing um, product of constants, which I don't write down for simplicity. You, you get these algebraic numbers, piatic algebraic numbers. Is it? No, no, no. I mean, no, no, no. These are, I mean, you should really think of them as just elements of the Siwasawa algebra, which when you, I mean, they're too, you, you can either think of it as a measure or you can think of it in terms of um, group ring elements, uh, like in the finite level. And if you, so these. I know you're thinking of measure theory, but this is different. This is different yeah, because it's going to measure in a proponent group. And the way you should think of the measure is like you, you think of what happens on, on the level of the group rings in the inverse limit. And when you specialize, like if you have a primitive character, that will its conductor will determine which which level in the profile limit you specialize to, and that's really obvious. It's like it's so much easier than real measure theory. <laughs> that it, it's really just the case that you evaluate, and um, yeah, and so it's it's almost like it's almost uh, yeah. And many people don't yeah. It, it's it's a measure in this in this in this much uh, simpler sense. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, it's really a symbol. You, you can really think of it in terms, like when you're, when you're evaluating the finite order character, you really, it, that, that choice of character will select, um, you know, a, a component in, in the profinite limit. And you're just looking at what happens on that group ring. And you're really, you're really just, it's really a finite sum. That's what I'm saying. You have finite order character, it's a finite sum. And so it's per, arguably a misuse of notation to use the integral sign. But um, I do it just to get the idea across. So yeah, this is the piatic avatar that I mentioned. And how does it relate? How do you how I make conjectures relate it to um, the Selmer group? Well, okay, the Mordal Bay group um, is related to the Selmer group, the P primary Selmer group, which is defined in terms of Galois cohomology. I'm not going to define what it is, but instead I just tell you it fits into the short exact sequence. So you have um, Mordal Bay group. Let's just work over KP infinity. This is some limit, the finite extensions. 
the k-infinity rational points tensor qp mod zp going into this uh, p primary summer group which could be defined implicitly through its inclusion in the short exact sequence um, going into the p primary part of the tate shaffer rich group of v over k-infinity so consider the poantry eigen dual it's just the space of homomorphisms uh, from the summer group to qp mod zp it's not hard to show that this has the structure of a finitely generated compact lambda g module and so this is really this is really where the algebra comes in and uh, the main conjecture here can now be stated. So it's a two-part statement. Well, it's actually a three-part statement. The first, the first part of the statement is that there exists a piatic avatar LP. I wrote down before. You want to construct a piatic L function. You take for granted that you know enough about the, the L values that you can do that. And then you can get started on this main conjecture. The first statement is that the dual summer group is a torsion lambda G module. And so the torsion there is the key, the key word. It's very hard to show if you've heard about Euler systems before, this is usually what an Euler system is constructed to do. It's a sequence of Galois cohomology classes, which um, allows you to prove a statement like this. And then once you have such a statement, then you know by the structure theory of finitely generated torsion lambda G modules that you have a pseudo isomorphism, um, like a map, which goes from X E K infinity with pseudo null um, kernel and co-kernel. If G is equal to Z, um, if G is isomorphic as a topological group to ZP, then it's finite kernel and, and, and co-kernel simpler definition but you have um you, you have a structure theory of this form um you'll have a certain number of copies of you know, powers of, of p and these exponents ai and bj are determined uniquely you have some other um non-zero divisor elements of gj on the other side and so you can define a characteristic power series once you know that the the dual summer group is a torsion lambda g module and then the second state the second part of the statement is almost maybe even what you expect it's just that the principal ideal, which is generated by this, this piatic L function, this, this measure that I introduced, is equal to the principal ideal generated by the characteristic power series. This is the statement. I don't, I don't intend to say, I will say a little bit about what's known, and then I won't tell you anything at all about how these statements are proven. Are proven. But I want to explain how the implication works. Like, if you know uh, the main conjecture, or even one divisibility of it, you can go from... Yeah, the question of bounding more Delvey ranks can be related to the question of showing non vanishing of L values. Um, so you start with this Kummer exact sequence, which, which I wrote down before. And here's a simplistic example. It's not usually so nice. If you have a finite extension L of K contained in K infinity, and you know um, that each of the twists factoring to the Galois group, I'm taking for granted a lot of identifications from class field theory here, um, is non zero. Equivalently, that each of the corresponding twists of the automorphic L function is non zero. And then you know by, by the construction of the definition of the piatic L function that the specialization of the or the integration of the, of the measure for each of the characters W is non-vanishing. But if you know the main conjecture, or even just one divisibility of it, then you can make the same statement about the specialization of the characteristic power series. Because the characteristic power series is also an element of the Yusawa algebra. You can also specialize it, or you can also integrate. And uh, you can deduce in this in this in this setup at least that you have no points of infinite order. It's just a torsion group. And this is, I mean, it looks a little, it might look a little bit um, simplistic, but this is basically the way that people verify special cases of Sorry. a character group. Character group. Sorry. Yeah. It's just a shorthand notation. What I'm doing is I'm I'm, I'm identifying Edel class characters or Hacker characters with the corresponding Galois characters, um, composing with the art and reciprocity map. It's yeah, I should have explained that, but it's just uh, to give a to give an overview. If you have a Galois theoretic description, you have a class field theoretic description. They are equivalent. So obedient. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. So fragments. Um, do I have half an hour? Good. Okay. I want to say first of all, what's known about like in this particular situation, what we actually know about the main conjectures, um, and it, it's still not completely resolved. Even even the main conjecture, which is strictly weaker than Burstman entire. But I'd like to say what's known uh, thanks to the L values. And then I'd like to explain a strategy for approaching the L values. So let's say you have an elliptic curve defined over Q, and P is a prime of good ordinary reduction. If you reduce mod P, you still have an elliptic curve. It's the easiest situation you can consider. Um, there's an interesting dichotomy that needs to be taken into account here. So the, um, the Hass of AL function of U over K, which has an analytic continuation to a rank and Selberg L function of F times some theta series, associated to K, will uh, satisfy a functional equation, um, symmetric functional equation, 
with, with both with the same L function on each side, and there will be a sign. The root, th there will be a sign in the functional equation. It'll be plus one or minus one. Um, and we need to write epsilon to note the sign because um, different things happen in each case. Now, in the picture I drew before, there was a cyclotomic tower and an anti-cyclotomic tower. Let me first say what happens in the cyclotomic tower. There's a really important theorem due to Kazuya Kato, um, which together with another important theorem of Skinner and Urban and a non-vanishing theorem due to Rorlich, allow me to say the following thing. So Kato plus Rorlich, Rorlich's, theorem is Rorlich's non vanishing theorem is actually very necessary to get the torsion. This is a subtle point. So it really should be attributed also to, to Rorlich. The dual Selmer group of the elliptic curve of the cyclotomic ZP extension, which is just one piece, um, where, where, the, um, where the corresponding Galois group, the, the profanic Galois group gamma is topologically isomorphic to ZP, is a finitely generated torsion lambda gamma module. Okay, so the, the, the analogous statement which I didn't write down, but it's completely analogous to the two-variable case. Um, you know a lot, you basically know this in, in the one-variable case. So you know that the corresponding restriction of the, of the measure or the, the one-variable Piatikal function generates an ideal, which is the same as um, the, the ideal generated by the characteristic power series of the dual Selmer group of the, of the cyclotomic XIP extension, um, where this exists because you know that the module is torsion. Yeah, so this is a typo here. And as a consequence, by Rolex non vanishing theorem, you can deduce via a similar argument to what I presented before in a simpler case that um, EK cyclotomic is finitely generated. Or if you look at it in terms of the picture, um, the REKN is, is N, var KN varies over degree P to the N extensions of uh, K containing cyclotomic ZP extensions bounded. Okay. Um, in the anticyclotomic tower, there are two situations, depending on the root number. So in a nutshell, if the root number is plus one, everything looks more or less the same. We know a bit less. We have a similar set of results. So yeah, in the case where the root number is plus one, the dual Selmer group is a torsion lambda omega module. And you know that it therefore has a characteristic power series um, by the structure theorem of finitely generated torsion lambda modules. The corresponding piatic L function generates a principal ideal, which is contained in the principal ideal generated by the characteristic power series. We do not yet know the other inclusion. Um, and, and hence, by Vatsal's non-vanishing theorem for the central values, you can deduce the same uh, thing, that the, the mordell Bay group of, of E over the anti-cyclotomic ZP extension is, is finitely generated, or in other words, like the mordell Bay rank is bounded as you ascend the anti-cyclotomic tower. Um, in the case of root number minus one, this is very interesting. So for those of you who are number theorists, you know that there are Hegner points or it, it's actually not true that the dual Selmer group is a torsion lambda omega module. It actually has lambda omega rank one. And there's a different form of the main conjecture in that situation formulated by Bernard at Perenru 30 years ago. And um, it takes a slightly different form. You consider a compactified Selmer group instead of the regular Selmer group or the, the dual Selmer group. And you write H infinity to note this Hegner submodule generated by Hegner or CM points. Um, which yeah, and, and then in that case, the main conjecture takes a different form. So the compactified Selmer group modulo, the, the Hegner submodule is conjectured to be final a, a torsion lambda omega module, hence has a characteristic power series. And the conjecture is that the, gener um, the principal ideal generated by the characteristic power series um, is equal to the characteristic power series of the maximal torsion submodule of the dual Selmer group of, of V over D infinity. And uh, theorem of Benjamin Howard shows one divisibility of that conjecture. And when you, when you pair that result, which I've only just mentioned very briefly, with a non-vanishing theorem due to Christoph Cornu for the central derivative values, you actually get a systematic rank formula. So if I write D sub n to denote the unique degree P to the n extension of K contained in the anti-cyclotomic ZP extension, then if n is sufficiently large, the rank R E D n is given by the degree of the extension, p to the n plus an error term, an error term which is independent of the exponent n. So that's sort of what you can, so let me, yeah, so you know, you know what happens for each of the ZP extensions, but that tells you nothing about what happens in the composite. And so I thought about this problem for some time. Um, yeah, so there are two ways to deduce that the dual Selmer group has the structure of a lamb, of the torsion lambda G module. You can either construct an Euler system directly, um, which Skinner and Urban did, um, a little over 10 years ago. And, and I, I showed that in similar situations without constructing an Euler system, you could just deduce it from Kato's theorem. 
you know that there is a characteristic power, a two variable characteristic power series. And then Skinner and Urban in some major technical work, which was motivated by proving the cyclotomic main conjecture, show that if the root number is one, this is still completely open if the root number is minus one, and a long list of technical hypotheses, which would fill up half the page, that the ideal generated by the two variable piatic L function is contained in the ideal generated by the two variable um, characteristic power series. And um, I've also done some work where, well, this is an old paper I published in Journal of Algebra, but um, if P does not divide the measure, then you can reduce, you can actually reduce that statement about uh, the one divisibility of the main conjecture to a specialization criterion, which is in principle more elementary and potentially accessible by existing results, although I never saw how to do that. Okay, also, I mean, I just go through this very quickly because it's uh, beside the point. You can also um, compute Euler characteristics um, and essentially, if you view the characteristic power series as a measure specialized to the trivial character and, um, and verify the, the P part of the refined purchase name dire conjecture. So this is not, this is something that, uh, that one can do. It's not that hard. You can also consider if H is the Galois group of the cyclotomic ZP extension over the cyclotomic extension, you can also determine a lambda H module isomorphism. Um, the dual summer group is going to be lambda e copies of um, of lambda h, uh, where lambda e k is the um, is the is the is the lambda invariant, which which appears in the structure theorem. Um, and this, I mean, I, I won't go into a lot of detail with this, but you can find you can use this to find examples where the p primary part of the Tate Sheffer bridge group with the elliptic curve over the zp squared extension is often massive. So, for instance. We find elliptic curve with conductor 53, p equals 5 over the imaginary quadratic field, q adjoins square root minus 31. And um, you can deduce from this rank formula that I wrote down that the, the p primary part of the Tate Sheffer average group of e over k infinity um, has lambda h co rank 9. So it's huge. It contains uncountably many copies of qp mod zp. So this is interesting. Or, yeah, where p is equal to 5. <laughs> um, but what's really more to the point here is that you want to bound more of a ranks in, in the compositum. And uh, you don't know a lot about the L values. You don't have an Euler system. And so um, there is nevertheless a way you can proceed. And so if you, if you use these two variable main conjecture results and you, you establish some non-vanishing estimates for families of L functions, you can prove something of the following form. If you have an elliptic curve divided over Q and P a prime of good ordinary reduction, epsilon is the sign. If the sign is one, then you can deduce that it's, uh, that the k infinity rational points is finitely generated, but there's a bound for the more more null rank in the compositum, and in the case of the sinus minus one, the same is true for the compositum modulo the anticyclotomic tower where you have growth from Hegner points, as I illustrated before. And so the proof, if I have 20 minutes, goes into a completely different territory of mathematics, because you know I mean you know this machine, um, the U.S. Howard main conjecture machine reduces you to studying automorphic L functions to, to get these sorts of bounds from Mordell Bay ranks. And so you never work with the Hasse Bay L function, you work with automorphic L functions, and you have to prove non vanishing estimates for families, thin families, the families over, like you want to average over, so I drew this picture, you want to, you want to be able to average over these, the characters in these Galois groups of these Greek PDN extensions. And this is very delicate. So but nevertheless, you can do this, especially on the anti cyclotomic side, and using a different approach to what Cornu and Batsa uh, do in their, their results, and a different approach to what Rorlich does in his, a completely different approach to what these guys do. You can use the spectral theory of automorphic forms. Um, and in doing this, a lot of the picture can be generalized to a CM field. And there are a lot of interesting directions that this could, this sort of uh, circle of techniques could go into. So I just want to, to give you a flavor of how this works. We now sort of forget about the classical motivations, we forget about the curves, and we go instead to the families of automorphic L functions, the families of the rankin selberg L functions that I wrote down before. And I want to look at the simplest situation. So the sign is one. Um, I'm going to estimate averages over being class characters of a given conductor. Um, I'm, there are a lot of, I, I'm simplifying this. Uh, I would need to use Mirbius inversion and as, uh, consider averages over primitive characters, but that is just a technical complication. I mean, this is this gives you the kernel of the idea. So let me write rho to denote a, a ring class character of conductor P to the A or P to the alpha. So it'll be, um, it's basically like a character of the class group of the ideal class group of K, except that you allow for ramification to given prime P. 
and you consider averages of these central values. Okay, you consider slightly smaller averages in general, but this gives you an idea. So this value, I mean, if you look at the Dirichlet series, um, the value at s equals one half or the central point, um, s equals one in the classical normalization, um, it's outside of the range of absolute convergence for the Dirichlet series. But there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a cool trick that you can use to um, describe these central values in terms of finite sums of this form where omega d denotes the quadratic Dirichlet character associated to d and lambda f is the um, Fourier coefficient or equivalently Hecke eigenvalue of f and lambda theta rho is that for the, the Hecke theta series and v is a yeah and so the, the, the coefficient for the Hecke theta series has a very sort of classical formula it's, it's going to be a twisted sum over counting functions um, functions that count the number of ideals of a given norm in a class a of, of the ring class group the class group. If you take alpha equals zero, this is just the class group. And V is a, a smooth function of rapid decay given by this contour integral of a real part of S equals two, where G is the Mellon, G star S is just the Mellon transform of some smooth and compactly supported function G. So this is um, a technique known as the approximate functional equation. It gives you an exact formula. It's not approximate at all. And you work with this, um, use orthogonality of characters to see essentially that you pick up contributions only from the principal class. Um, in general, you have to consider other classes as well, but they, they satisfy constraints. And uh, you open up the counting function. If I assume for simplicity, the discriminant D of the imaginary quadratic field is congruent to zero mod four, you can use this parameterization, which is really neat. So um, the number of ideals in the principal class of norm N is equal to one over the number of roots of unity in K um, times the number of pairs of integers A and B such that A squared minus B squared D equals, equals N. And so what you do is you, you take the, you take the expression you need to estimate, you plug that in. And you can see almost immediately by inspection that there's gonna be a leading term and an off-diagonal term. So the leading term is gonna come from B equals zero. Um, and if you, if you look at what that is and you just expand out the definitions, you, you can actually sort of open that up and do a pleasant contour argument and shift the range of integration, pick up a residue um, of, of some other L functions at S equals one. And you know that these don't vanish and you know that these, in fact, have lower bounds. They satisfy lower bounds. And the remaining um, error term is bounded and suitably as, as either the discriminant D or the, or the exponent alpha becomes large. So that's the leading term. Then the key innovation is to um, estimate the remaining B not equal zero terms by completely reinterpreting them as the Fourier coefficient of some other form. And so, um, yeah, so you reinterpret as a Fourier coefficient so you set up the problem in a more abstract way. You see, you, you don't look at uh, the eigenform F or the elliptic curve E anymore. You now look at some automorphic, cuspidal automorphic representation of GL2. Um, and so you, you consider a pure tensor in the representation space. Uh, you write side to note the standard additive character. You have some sort of Fourier expansion or Fourier-Whitaker expansion with these more abstract forms. The, the so-called Whitaker coefficients just look like unipotent integrals. It's very much like usual Fourier theory, um, you know, a vector of this form will have a Fourier series expansion or a Fourier Whitaker expansion of this form. And so, um, you know, more specifically, you can write it this way. And there's this relation to the L function coefficients. If you choose, if you choose your vector suitably, you have this direct relation to the coefficients that appear in the L function of, of F for the elliptic curve. And so you, you actually have a way of varying vectors in the Archimedean Kirillov model, um, so there's, there's a way, I'm being a bit abstract here, but you, you have a lot of freedom. You can actually, I, I claim it's, it's a, you can do, deduce from theorems of uh, the old timer, Jacquet and uh, Pietro P. Shapiro, Chalaika. You can choose a vector such that um, the, the Archimedean Whitaker function, so if y is a real variable, and I consider this integral and this coefficient, you, you can choose the vector in such a way that that will match a given test, a given compactly supported test function. And so that's very convenient um, what you can do after you have this amazing property, uh, which is the surjectivity of the Archimedean local Kirillov map, is you can introduce a metaplectic theta series. Um, it's just like a, it's just like a theta series of half integral weight, or like a, a Jacobi theta series essentially. Um, just a little, it's written down a little bit more abstractly, but it's essentially a half integral weight theta series. And what you can do is choose. You can choose your vector. You can choose your pure tensor in such a way. You choose the Archimedean component of your pure tensor in such a way that um, the Fourier coefficient of the product of the pure tensor with the metaplectic theta series um, has Fourier coefficient 
who has a Fourier coefficient, which is essentially the sum you want to estimate. So after you have this identification, which is not so hard to show, you reduce the bounding. You, you, what you do is you, you, you take that product of forms, you decompose spectrally, and then you use spectral theory of automorphic forms to get bounds for the remaining sums. And what you get here, if you do that, is the following kind of theorem. This is, this is really a baby case. You can do this a lot more generally, although it becomes very delicate and technical. And so if you let delta naught be the best bound for Fourier coefficients of half integral weight forms, so these, these are metaplect, genuine metaplectic forms. Uh, so these are automorphic forms in the two-fold metaplectic cover of G, which is what one of these state of series happens to be in, in more abstract terms. Um, by theorem of Conan and Zagier, this is equivalent to the best approximation um, towards the generalized Lindelof hypothesis for GL2 automorphic forms in the level aspect. Um, so this is a different conjecture. Um, but I just, I just say that there's an interpretation, sort of dual interpretation of this coefficient delta. And, and we know in particular that we can take it to be 3 over 16 by theorem of Blomer and Hart. So what you end up with is an estimate of this form for, for the coefficient, for the Fourier coefficient, i.e. for the remaining off-diagonal sum, you can, you can establish an upper bound of the form. Um, you know, it, it, the, the modulus is bounded above by a product of um, the discriminants of the quadratic fields times p to the two alpha. Um, p to the alpha is the conductor of the character, all to the power of minus four plus delta naught plus epsilon, where delta naught is strictly less than a quarter. So that means if you let if you let D become large, you let alpha become large, that goes to zero. And so if you put that together with the, the pleasant contour argument for the B equals zero terms, you end up with a suitable estimate. You get something which, you know, if alpha is sufficiently large in particular, you get a non-vanishing term plus a bounded error. And so you can, you can do these sorts of estimates. Yeah, and this, this will give you what you need. You put this together with properties of the piatic alpha function, use things like virus stress preparation to get stronger results. Um, and you can, you can say what is needed to determine um, the property, the, the balance for the Mordal Bay ranks that I wrote before. So in the remaining 10 minutes, I just want to say that there's a new, um, there's a competing approach, which is due to Cornu and Batsal. Um, I mentioned these theorems of Batsal and Cornu, which apply to the anti cyclotomic ZP extension. And they use a fundamentally different idea. Well, okay, let me just say there's, there's a lot that one can do in this direction, which is very interesting from the point of view of both automorphic forms and analytic number theory. So generalizing to thinner families and higher rank groups is a hard and interesting open problem. Um, the setup is there. A lot of the setup will carry over for GLN automorphic all functions, but there's still a lot to do um, for the estimates. It's very interesting, a source of open problems. Another really interesting problem is if you forget about Birch and Sinan and Dyer, and you try to, um, so we've only looked at the central point uh, for the functional equation, the center of the critical strip. But if you try to go closer to the edge, uh, to real part of S equals zero, um, estimating such families would have really important applications to the Langlands program. In particular, by the, by the, by the approach of Lua, Rudik, and Sarnak, you could conceivably um, prove Selberg's conjecture or prove the generalized Ramanujan conjecture if, if you could get an estimate of this form uh, for the real part of S, real part of S not equal to one half, but rather something smaller than seven over 64, you would definitely get, I mean, that, that would be a huge results. Uh, that would be very interesting. It's hard though. It's hard to get uh, close to the edge. So yeah, there's a distinct, yeah. So that's, there's, there's a lot to do there. I think it's really interesting. I have some work, which is not yet finished, uh, which I discussed with people, a lot of open problems. Um, but there's also a distinct approach um, with automorphic periods where you don't work with all functions at all. Uh, I say something about that very briefly. It's sort of the, the starting point of the theorems of Cornu and Batsal, which I mentioned. And it turns out there's a lot to do there as well uh, for the higher rank cases, thanks to recent advances on, on some other conjectures known as the gongress prasad conjectures. So, I mean, I mentioned these theorems um, when I was talking about the partial results. And these theorems are remarkable. They don't work with the all functions. They work with these automorphic periods. They work with different integral presentations of the central values. So roughly speaking, in the situation that I sketched a minute ago, um, the theorem of baltz berger tells you that instead of working with, yeah, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing this in a slightly weird way. The theorem of baltz berger actually shows that, um, proves that the central value of the automorphic Gauss function, the rank and Selberg Gauss function of F times the eigen, um, the theta series associated to rho, it's not vanishing if and only if you can find a vector in the Jacquet Langlands transfer of, of the GL2 form to a quaternion algebra such that the following, inter the, the integral over the E del class group of K 
against the vector against the character doesn't vanish. And you can actually use this formula to get up, up, to, some, up to some constant, which can be made precise. The central value of the L function that you want to consider is equal to the complex modulus squared of one of these automorphic periods. The period, a period, a period here is just like an integral over the Dahl class group of K of, um, you know, a vector here in the Jacquet Langlands um, transfer or lift, excuse me, against the character. And so, yeah, broadly speaking, you don't work with the L function at all. You just work with these period, these, these so-called automorphic periods. In the case of, um, in the case of, yeah, that's in the case of epsilon equals the one, equals, equals one. Um, in the case of the root number is minus one, you use the theorem of Gross and Zagier and, and higher analogs of that. And, and that, in, in, in a way which is more technical, gives you a similar formula for um, never having to look at the L functions. You, you just look at similarly defined automorphic periods, but they have a different, yeah, okay. And uh, if you want to set up the, the averaging, get non-vanishing estimates, in this situation, you end up with a purely group theoretic or ergodic theoretic problem. And uh, Cornier and Vatsal use those celebrated theorems of Ratner and Margulis Tomanoff on Piatic unipotent flows to get estimates um, after setting things up in this way. And it seems that the approach of Cornier and Vatsal can be extended to higher rank groups um, using recent advances on the each, you know, Ikeda, Gangros, Prasad conjectures for unitary groups. I won't say much about this, but there's a lot to do in this direction too. It's very interesting. And it would have, um, it would have applications to the block how domain conjectures for certain automorphic motives. So this is a very hot topic. It's very interesting because there's new, there are new technological advances um, which make it possible to explore future directions, such as automorphic periods on higher rank groups, um, intertwining with spectral decomposition of automorphic forms, such as what I sketched before. And um, yeah, in general, uh, there might be a pathway to establishing arithmetic level raising new constructions of Euler systems and um, results towards analogs of the Iwasawa Greenberg main conjectures for Galois representations associated to GLN, regular algebraic conjugate self dual uh, representations of GLN over CM fields as constructed in the 10 author paper, and um, also approaches to block how domain conjectures. So these are, these are all hot topics, um, which I haven't explained, but somehow this is, this is a strategy to get into that area. And uh, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of interesting potential generalizations uh, with a lot of with a lot of potential projects for students and collaborators. So I wanted to thank you again for the invitation and also for your attention. Yeah. 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 Questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, wait, 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 there are algorithms, but you can't verify that, that what you get is, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I guess if we knew the Tate Chef average group were finite, if we, if we knew the Tayshia Favich conjecture, then yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll, up, to, up to the Tayshia Favich conjecture. Yeah. Um, well, I um. You have you know, but no, no, no. But you have to be completely open minded to the conjecture being wrong. There are some people. I shouldn't say this. It's maybe a gossipy. There's some people who don't think there's enough evidence for Birch and Swin and Dyer. The Don Zagier is very famously voiced his concern. The computations of Birch and Swinner and Dyer are mostly to the, this family of elliptic curves, where it's like rank zero and rank one. There's actually not that much computational evidence, the conjecture in higher ranks. Yeah, yeah, you have to be psychologically comfortable with conjectures because we don't know very much in number theory. You just have to but also be open. It's actually more interesting if you can disprove a conjecture. <laughs> I'm sure you get the million dollars and a lot more. No. People... <laughs> <That's saying sorry. laughs> No, it, no, it wouldn't. No, it wouldn't. That's a, that's a good question. No, it wouldn't. I mean, it would if the Riemann hypothesis were false. It would. Um, no, but we, there's no. I mean, there's no good conceptual reason for why Birch, Swinner, and Dyer ought to be true. And in some, in some sense, that's exactly why we can't address rank two and greater. Is because we don't even know exactly why these proofs work. There's no simplification 
also of Wiles's proof. We have no idea like even how to think about the, the integral presentations of the central derivative values um, for the Hasse al functions, even with the analytic continuation. And so somehow we don't, have, we don't even have a concept of why it should be true. And I don't think mathematics would fall apart if it were false. It'd be very interesting if it were false, or if the Teichef Favich group, if the Teichef Favich conjecture fails, that would be very interesting. Oh, yes, I agree with you. No, basically, the word period is so badly overused. So the period in the sense of Kontievich and Zagy. Yeah, and and, and, and broad, broadly, broadly speaking, you could, yeah, I mean, this is kind of, it's not similar in, it, similar in spirit, but it's not, it doesn't exactly follow. You can, well, okay, I, I need to be careful what I say here. Like if you work with an imaginary quadratic field and you, in the setup that I described here, you choose Archimedean components of your vectors very carefully and you're very specific. You can make sure that those, those automorphic periods that I wrote down follow the, follow the definition of, or con, conform to the definition of Kontievich and Zagier. However, they're, they're different, like the word period gets so grossly mis overused. The automorphic periods, the automorphic periods that you hear people talking about, especially in the context of like Baldwige, Gross Zagier, Shino Ikeda, Gangris Versa, they're all basically like integrals over Edel class groups, or you might have a distinguished um, reductive subgroup H of G, and you consider you consider an integral over that, and that's what people mean by automorphic periods. Okay, and that's like a priori distinct from what Kontievich and Zagier mean by a period, except at least in special cases, if you make very special choices of vectors and you write everything down classically, then you can prove that that's a period in the sense of Kontievich Zagier. But, but but to put it another way, if you can find an example of a number which is not a period in the sense of Kontievich and Zagier, you definitely have a paper in the annals. I mean, this I don't think there's any. New example of a yes, I think. Wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. Um, there's no, no, no. There's um. The point is, you need an integral presentation, and I don't say anything about E. Sorry. Yeah. No. No, 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 no. But it's not. But there are there are transcendental numbers which are periods. The point is, it's not. It's it's a more general. It's more general than algebraic numbers. You have. Yeah. 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 No, but uh, it's, yeah. Well, I, th I think it's a major open problem, like showing, just exhibiting a number which isn't a period, or which, which, yeah, yeah. But yeah, they are they are periods in the sense of Kontievich Zagier, but it's a it's a proposition to prove it. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Let's thank Julie for a very rich Yes, <laughs> <laughs>